Um, this was the, the things we were supposed to uh, discuss, um, uh, which is about um, uh, networks and how this fits with the whole uh, uh, consortium. Which one I'm using? Um, so, uh, by means of the, the higher level of, we started by talking about uh, what are networks and why do we need them in, in the first place. So, uh, when we're talking about networks, uh, uh, we can think about a, a nodes that are representing genes and proteins and transcription factors, but they can also, uh, we can also talk about networks of, of, of cells. So, each cell has its own network and then the communication between, between cells at the level of the tissue and then at the level of of organs and, and, and so forth. So we had a bit of a, a discussion about, a, about that and, uh, and also about the, um, uh, the semantics. So, so uh, in those networks, we also have edges, so the edges can represent uh, uh, the type of regulation between the, the different entities, uh, but they um, sometimes, uh, um, they, we need more, more details than that, so we're really talking about the operational rules that govern the behavior of these networks that are actually a signature of some cellular uh, phenotype and how do we go from, from the um, low level interaction, whether these are activation, inhibition, to actually a, 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 cell, um, a, cell, a particular cell behavior. So what is the, the state of, of these networks and how they are mapped to uh, cellular behaviors? Um, and, uh, and then, oh, you change it to the... Okay, so, so uh, the first uh, question that we tackled are what are the type of uh, uh, mechanistic models that we would want to see using this uh, uh, consortium. So, and when, we're talk when we are thinking about a mechanistic model, we are talking about either um, uh, intracellular uh, uh, signaling networks and uh, intercellular uh, signaling the data, so the communication between cells, and obviously each part is led by different parts of the data. So th we had some discussion about the fact that we really use different parts of the data for different parts of these uh, network models, and, and we use one part to construct the network and another part to actually test whether the network represents a certain uh, uh, observations that we have. And this is, uh, on the computational sense, this is how we make sure that we never overfeed these models. Um, and when we talked about mechanistic models, one thing is to think about them as, as um, as static pictures. This is what we've been using uh, for years and years in, in experimental biology, but now we appreciate the fact that we're trying to capture a, a very dynamic uh, process, so we have to make sure that these networks are also dynamics, and that's the whole idea of trying to build these algorithms that can uh, take us to the level of executable networks. Okay, so, so the idea is that we want to, um, at the end of the day, to try and figure out what are the programs that the cells are executing based on all the data that we collected to produce a particular behavior. So this is what we're after. And then there was a discussion about the fact that uh, in terms of um, motivation for the whole, uh, it's, it's, it's great that we would have these huge amounts of, of, of data and information and we want to understand, to, to know all the different types of cells, but it would be even greater if we can have some kind of signature in terms of a, a, a network model for each of the types of the, of the cells, because that would really take us from what we um, refer to as data or information to actually knowledge about the system. So it will help us understand how we actually go to a particular uh, cellular behavior. And of course, the other side of that is that everything happens. One part of the data is about normal uh, conditions. The other part can teach us about uh, disease conditions. So we can also have network models that represent particular uh, disease states, okay? Um, and, and then we had, uh, I'm jumping between things because I'm, I'm not following the, uh, we had a, an interesting discussion about um, uh, when we mentioned the, the disease things, whether we should really focus on not try and capture all the different uh, types and build networks for all of them, but really take one or two paradigm uh, systems uh, and, and, and study them in depth and, and see if we can then harness that to, to gradually expand it across the, the entire atlas. Now, is there any, um, anything in particular? Ah. We also had a discussion about what kind of data we think we are still missing or what kind of data we would like to focus on in order to make sure that if we realize that this is eventually the, the long-term vision to create such a, a, a mechanistic models in the form of networks, 
what is it that we really need to make sure that we collect a priori so to have, it's almost like, a, you know, when we, uh, any ex kind of experiments we do, we have the question in mind and then we go in and, and ga gather the data rather than have, a, have the data and then think what kind of questions we're asking. So this is really important that very early on we know what we are after and we can think about what kind of data. And then we um, discussed about the importance of perturbation data that will really help us um, uh, uh, pin down how we can connect these uh, uh, networks to uh, uh, phenotypes. What... Uh, uh, so maybe... Oh, well, I, I jumped into... Ah, we also had well, a yeah, yeah, good, okay. discussion so, about... Uh, maybe I can... Question? Yeah, just go a little bit we back. Oh. Yeah. One second. All right, so I, I guess... Um, just to complement what, uh, what uh, uh, Yasmin me. was was talking about, so uh, it's what can these networks do for us, right? So um, great, I broke the system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think that one thing that is a, a very nice deliverable of, of this network analysis to the human cell atlas, right? So we're talking about um, a categorization of cells into states, into types, based on the information that we see. And one of the opinions, one of the things that came up in, in, that, in that discussion was that we can actually use uh, states of networks, the way that we can perceive them by looking at, at, um, at the variability between single cells in a given position, a given time, point in time, or a specific position in the tissue, as a way of um, expressing the state of the cell, right? So instead of characterizing a cell or characterizing a, a, a position a, a, in a tissue based on the re relative expression of uh, relative levels of gene expression, instead we are looking at how the network looks like. Uh, so that, that was, um, so, so you can think about it just maybe as a more higher level uh, way of, of, of uh, expressing the data that we will be collecting. Uh, in addition to that, it was, uh, there was some nice discussion about kind of jumping between intercellular and intracellular networks, and on both of them, there seem to be like very nice type of application that we can do uh, where the data that will be collected uh, in the context of the inter intracellular, so we're talking about chromatin data, uh, specifically a taxic, and single, single cell RNA-seq, which, um, which is conceivable to be able to use that convincingly to actually build, uh, to build networks uh, on the level of the uh, intercellular, intercellular. So we talked quite a lot about Gary Nolan's um, um, presentation yesterday where basically uh, uh, where we can do some sort of analysis based on proximity of cells and how the proximity changes uh, across different conditions. Um, and let's see just if we have... Um... I just want to add on that. So we talked about uh, uh, the multi-scale kind of models which uh, sort of combine both the intra and the intra in, in one, uh, in one uh, platform. So we refer to them usually as hybrid models where you have the cell signaling as, as, a, as a, a Boolean or something like Boolean network that drives also the more spatial aspects of, of, of the cells and how they are organized within the tissue, a tumor or anything uh, uh, specific. And then one drives the other and, and vice versa. So you really have these um, uh, multi-scale hybrid models that combine both the, the intra and the intracellular uh, aspects. Um. So maybe I'll just conclude with the, with the technical challenges. I think that it was fairly obvious that this is something that's going to be very hard. I don't think people we weren't very naive about that. Um, one thing that came out is just from the technical view of working with single-cell RNA-seq, there was some consensus that imputation is going to be required. Um, and that, that only motivates more, uh, you know, thinking about it more generally as a more general problem that will be applicable when you're thinking about networks. Uh, and mitigating noise in general, we can be very sensitive looking at correlations, so looking at any sort of information sharing between genes uh, it can be very hard. Uh, so, so there, basically, the idea was to use everything that we can to, to mitigate that, uh, looking at replication, looking at complementary uh, data sources. Again, the, the, the ideal, of course, would be to look at chromatin from the same single cells. Um, uh, inclusion of multiple data points, so, so basically we can mitigate noise by looking at some sort of a smooth transition, uh, maybe a longer tissue or a long time course, which will help us to uh, hopefully to, uh, to smooth out some of the noise. We talked a little bit about what we can do with uh, inter-individual data. So basically if we have, let's say, single cell data from a given tissue from 10 donors, 20 donors, we also have their DNA, what can we do with that? And here the consensus was, not very much. Uh, we are very much <laughs> underpowered. We can't really do much with it. What it can give us is some sort of uh, uh, the convex hull, uh, 
estimation thereof about uh, you know the differences, the inter-individual differences, at least in in uh, in, uh, in homeostasis, uh, which is you know a good way to start. Uh, but in this respect, one thing that was kind of interesting and, and drew some attention from the people is is how to work with somatic mutations. Uh, so when we look at tumor data, when we look at any disease that that has uh, you know prevalent somatic mutations, something that we can definitely use for the purpose of linear tracing that can help in network analysis, but also for maybe for uh, getting it as maybe some um, um, perturbations uh, uh, that, that are uh, naturally occurring that we can use for this type of inference. So that was my addition. Okay. Uh, questions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, thanks. So I think there was also, there were also some comments about uh, that probably um, uh, the construction of networks, the, the interpretation of networks would be much aided uh, by data from uh, model organisms. Yes, absolutely. Uh, where also, as we all know, perturbations can be done or have been done in uh, a lot of ways. Yes, so, so one of the questions that I uh, proposed to the, uh, to the audience there was, uh, if you just have, you know, you have the, 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 the reins for the human cell atlas, you can collect any data that you want, what are you going to do? Right, so, uh, and so, so the idea was to focus on one system and see you know, what is the best we can do to, to look at it. And, and one of the, the answers was, there, of course, yes. So use the multi-omics, basically anything we can do, chip sequencing and, and, and so on, if you want to understand transcription regulation, for example, but also look across organisms and, and use mouse, for example, to do some functional validations, which is, of course, very important, but also look at evolutionary conservations of the kind of things that we see. Another question? Well, the audience is pretty uh, quiet. Tired. <laughs> Tired. Okay. I will um, ask a question. You, mm -hmm. you said something that I found uh, very interesting, such appealing, of actually using networks as a guide to, to help us define what is cell type and cell state. So since I found that a particularly appealing and beautiful point, if you can elaborate on that for about a minute and a half or as long as you want. Or not yeah. as long as you want. Look. Less, so, minute and a half or less. Answering this? Yes, please. So, so one of the very fundamental things when we think about um, uh, network programs of, of, of representing cellular mechanisms is that the network actually represents a cell state. So we figure out what is the program, what is the network state for a particular uh, um, cell state, whether it's differentiation, proliferation, apoptosis, and so forth. So. That's something that you get for free when you, you work with this, this paradigm. And, 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 and I think it would be super useful to go to that level because I think that's where we want to be. Now, in order to be there, we have to collect all the information because in order to construct the, the, the network in the first instance, and, and not just the topology, but also all the logic embedded within the network and, and the rules that specifically govern the, the, the change in the, in the levels of each one of the, of the nodes in, in the network is something that we have in the data, but we just don't know how to interpret it. Now, when you, you build these programs, and in the first instance, you might be wrong about some of these rules because you see that they don't reproduce the known behavior, but that's exactly where you want to be because then you go back and you refine them again and again and again until you find a set that recreate the program that you observe. And all of that, you know, the, the, the observations are in the data and the other parts of the data is used to construct the, the models in the first place. But that will give you, a, a, I, I use the word signature, it will give you the signature. What does it mean to be in that state? And, and, and the, the power of that is that you can then use it to systematically identify what are the key nodes in the network in order to target them with, with, with drugs. Or you can also use that to mimic a, a, a disease state, and you can also use that in order to mimic a resistant state for a particular drug. But so you see what... Oh, no, I definitely, I mean, we're on the same page here. I actually would take it one step further and you know you're talking about these very detailed predictive dynamic networks that can actually give you in complete detail the state and of course that's a lofty goal for all of us to reach i'll, I'll give us five years for the entire uh, human body for all cell types uh but uh in as an in <laughs> ah, um, this is but uh, as an intermediate i do think that uh, concepts and more abstract concepts from networks and you know, much simpler abstract notions of networks 
before that goal can be used to define cell types. So cell types or cell states would be beyond a grocery list of uh, molecules or, or, or morphology, but actually some type of mechanistic backpinning for that cell type, which can, with time, grow more and more uh, detailed and accurate. So, so Dan, I agree with you completely. I think that for the purpose of uh, categorization, which is, which is important and which is something that like, is an immediate thing that we need in, 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 this, in, in, this, in this endeavor, I think that mechanist, you know, we don't need executable models for that. Uh, it is enough to look at some patterns of, of dependencies or, or sharing of information between genes and how do these things change in the context of interest, like in a certain stimulation or when we kind of just shift a little bit across the tissue. Um, it's very hard to do that. We know that, that correlation, covariation is super, super noisy. That's why this is one of the things that came out for the discussion. It, it would be ideal, you know, to also have a taxi or to have some sort of commenting, some sort of additional information we can use to, uh, to narrow down the things that you look at. Okay, so let's thank uh, these panelists and all the panelists, discussion leaders, and reporters. Uh,